Well, thank you so much. Um, well, everybody's aware of the topic, I think, of the discussion, and I'm very glad to be joined by Margrethe Vestager, Executive Vice President of the European Commission, and, of course, Helena Laurent, uh, Director General at Consumer International. So it's a big topic. We only have 35 minutes, but let's directly jump into, I think, the question of where do we stand in terms of protection, what has happened, and how do you make sure that consumers are safeguarded here in the euro area, in Europe? Well, I, th I think we are, we are putting, you know, real action behind our values. Uh, because it's easy to give a speech, it's difficult to make things happen in real life. Uh, we have now the Digital Services Act to make sure that the services that we are using, that they are truly safe. Um, businesses are requested uh, to do a risk assessment. Uh, can this service be damaging to your mental health? Uh, can it be addictive? Can it be used to undermine elections? Mm -hmm. And if they find that this is the case, they have to deal with it. Take those risks away. And, uh, and there will be a third independent party reviewing uh, all of this. Uh, they also need to make sure that they, they take away what is illegal. Uh, they need to know their customer, if it's, it's a trading platform. They need to make sure that if there is harmful content, that this is actually uh, taken down. And, uh, and now we got this legislation from the European Parliament and Council. Now we're enforcing it in full. So, uh, so we have real life, case, life cases. Uh, we have once against uh, TikTok. We have once against uh, X. Um, and we are watching over this to make sure that the businesses are doing what they are supposed to do. Otherwise, big fines will be coming. Um, let me briefly touch on the point of enforcement, because clearly that is so crucial. You have, can have rules, but no, if nobody is enforcing them, how is that going, especially across all these various jurisdictions? Well, the, it's, it's always difficult to, to pass new legislation. But through all that difficulty, you only change the mindset. Yeah. You change the perception. Only when you start enforcing do you change behavior. So if we want a different world, if we want what we think up in a summit of global solutions to work, well, then we need to put it out there uh, and enforce it. And, uh, and, and this is not an easy job. Because uh, for some of these businesses, we get quite close to the business model. And, uh, and then you need to, uh, to stand together. The commission enforces towards the very mm. big platforms, but member states, they will be enforcing towards smaller platforms. And, uh, and they, they need to stand up for one another to make sure that they get it right. Uh, but you have seen, for instance, the, the Irish was not afraid of fining hundreds of millions of euros on, uh, on Meta, so on, on Facebook, for their use of data. So, um, so I think also our national authorities, uh, they're getting their game up uh, in order to have the force to enforce. Helena, let me ask you, because in the end it's all about the consumer, what we are talking about. Um, what's the, the consumer experience like hands-on on the street right now facing the, this digital transformation? Sure. Well, it's great to be here. Um, it's rare that consumer organizations get invited in and it's fantastic to be on a, um, a stage where we can share that, that perspective. Um, I think if you, so we're uh, a federation of consumer organizations in 100 countries. So these are organizations that are listening to consumers, their complaints, their, the sort of the scams they're coming up against, you know, helping them with, with um, you know, over indebtedness, et cetera. And one of the things that you, you know, put first and foremost, two things. First, for consumers, this is co a cost of living crisis that continues. This impacts on food and energy. So the digital world we're living through has to help them on that. And then I think you, you say the consumer is center. There's an increasing realization, and here as well, that it's, it's consumer, it's worker, it's low and middle income countries, and it's how do we make that equity work for everybody? As you ask, I think as relates to the digital world, one of the things that um, consumer organizations in all of their different contexts, number one is scams. You know, this is, this is something everybody, if you've been scammed, you are not alone. Um, <laughs> one out of 10 people get their money back, and it's now costing a trillion, a trillion a year. 
in lost, you know, in, in financial loss. I mean, that is extraordinary. And that's no one, you know, that's a mix of solutions that we have to put in place for this to work. So, you know, we've heard the, the fantastic work that you're doing. 40% of countries don't have any legislation to deal with some of these things. And then we are also, as consumers, dealing across borders. Now, if my worries are then financial as a consumer and you know, energy and food, you start to look at all of the, the ways in which the digital world is pro bringing more risk <coughs> into our lives and not necessarily uncovering the opportunity. So I think that's one of the big things that we can talk about here and it's great to be part of that. Yeah, you were nodding. I think, would you like to expand on a couple of... Yeah, no, if, for instance, I, I'm Danish, uh, in my country, and I think in, in many countries, it's not it's not legal to steal your face, yes, uh, and to use it for for advertising uh, in a fraudulent uh, case uh, where there is basically no no legitimate business behind it. It's just using your face to scam people. Um, if if something like that is is illegal, then for instance, uh, Meta, Facebook will have to take it down. And if that doesn't happen, well, then we come knocking on their door and say, listen, you have an obligation. And, and we did that just last week to say, listen, you're not doing the job that the law tells you to do. So we come knocking because people get scammed, uh, people get used, and, and you lose trust in what you see online. Uh, and when you start losing trust in what you see online, then you also start losing trust in a number of other things. And that is, that is what keeps our society together. So, you know, every action that keeps the fraud and, and the scams at bay is, is strengthening our society. In that context, we also need to talk about cybersecurity, I think, in general. So it's such a wide topic, and it seems that we are still so vulnerable to all kinds of attack, being it from Russia, being it from elsewhere. Um, so what steps are you taking? Well, everybody needs to, to protect themselves. Yes. Uh, we need to know that we have people where we work uh, who have the the task to make sure that that data is being safe and there's no immunity and say oh but I didn't know no everybody will have to to do it uh, authorities are, are on it uh, all over but also it's important to to have mechanisms so that if one is being hacked that you actually know what to do um, if you are being scammed uh, that you know what to do for instance if if someone calls you, it sounds as if it's your son who says, I'm in this dire situation, I need you to wire me 5,000 euros, uh, that you have sort of a, a safe word, or is it at least I need to call you back, uh, because you cannot know that this is a real person. So you can be hacked, you can, a number of things can happen. <coughs> so important that we can trust in our, our um, uh, authorities, but also that we keep our own uh, sort of... Uh, uh, safety mechanism fresh in our uh, uh, smartphones or computers or, or what have we. It brings me actually to, I mean, makes me think that we need more education on that front. We have been speaking about this uh, before when we had a coffee. Um, so how important is it actually to bring like everybody up to speed? Because I think digitalization moves much faster than we actually do uh, know how to yeah, be able to use it. Yeah, so often when we talk uh, to businesses or governments, they will say, well, literacy is incredibly important. <coughs> yes, but, or yes, and. There is so much more that we need to do to make this work. Because when you, when you survey people, a lot of people will now know to change their password, they'll have a, very, but they won't know even today how to change their security settings. You know, And you think about what people are going through today, you know, they need to, they're learning about sustainability, they're learning about, so many different things are changing, and during a cost of living crisis. So what we would like to see is almost that, you know, consumer protection has, has been pushed into compliance, has been pushed into a, a sort of a space that needs to come out and be at the start of how we design 
new products. It needs to be, we need to move to a, a sort of almost a new generation of consumer care. I'm sounding like a business now, but the, there is something really about how do you design and not thinking about the last mile towards it. That's the first step we need to take. So when you design, start thinking about, you know, what is the way in which somebody will not just access it, but use it, and the way that it'll work for them. How do you get redress from it? That's incredibly difficult. And how do we measure the consumer outcomes so that this works for them? You know, we're measuring very much the wrong things, even to help consumers in the marketplace these days. Yeah, I mean, data protection. <laughs> yeah, let's clap. <laughs> no, I mean, very often data protection is just discussed as a matter where the data is actually warehoused. Um, that's probably not enough, right? So it's only the beginning or, or part, part of the problem. Um, the more data we are actually yeah, pro yeah, producing, the more protection needs to be. So what, are your thi what is your thinking about that? Well, just us talking about it here, I think, is, is part of the solution that one gets about, oh, I, I can do something. Um, with with the latest uh, changes, you know, those who, who sell you an, an iPhone, the operating system, is obliged to give you choice about what browser would you use, uh, what search engine would you use. And that has enabled quite a number of businesses to present themselves to people who have uh, designed their, their services exactly as, as we just heard, with, with safety first how to make sure that your data cannot leak uh, out somewhere, how to make sure that, that, um, that you don't have to do your cookie settings all the time because that is very annoying and very few people do it, but that it's sort of done and dealt with uh, once and for all. But the first step, of course, is, is that you should need to be aware. I have this choice. Actually, it has been made easy for me to protect myself and, uh, and if not, well, maybe I should ask somebody who is setting up a small class in the library or my neighbor who has tried this before, so that we have a conversation going about how to use these opportunities that are being presented mm. to us. Are there best practice examples? Because I really like to shed some light also on real life here, like best practice examples for um, yeah, what is going well or Anything comes to your mind? We, we look at what might not be going so well for <laughs> I mean, one of the roles of civil society is, is being a, uh, holding others to account <coughs> for what's going on in the marketplace, and there's a lot there. I mean, we talked about scams. I talk about, you know, one of the other things is transparency. You know, there's an opportunity here for us to use digital technologies to make things more transparent, take, you know, um, and yet there's a lot that can be more hidden. Look at remittances or you know, people who need to send money back to their, their country. There is 170, 187 million lost each year in you know, the fact that there are fees hidden, that it's not clear and transparent. So what I like then is seeing when uh, organizations are realizing that that's an opportunity. That's an opportunity to uncover a new type of business model, a new source of consumer care, but we need that to move faster. The other things we get excited about are perhaps imagine how you use digital to unlock sustainability. Now, we, we don't think of safety and sustainability as different things. So green is safe. Safety, the way in which we think about safety is evolving to include cybersecurity, to include sustainability. We need to be safe in our marketplace. Examples that are quite exciting are things like energy in energy, where organizations are saying, right, well, how do we put consumers together? How do we think about how they enter and have renewable energy solutions? We can then guarantee that their bills are lower. You know, that, that is exciting. It's what business is there to do to come up and innovate for us. Yeah, but at the same time, it actually, it's a nice bridge uh, to the business world. At the same time, we also need businesses to invest in Europe. Um, we need regulation. Is that like, um, yeah, uh, to, to strike the balance here between those two poles, is that difficult? Well, we have made some 
strategic choices. Uh, some of them may sound very sort of trivial, like technology should serve people. But the thing is that sometimes it's actually the other way around, that we are the ones being used, not technology making our lives easier. So, so that was our strategic uh, choice uh, in everything that, that we have been doing. And, uh, and that then, then leads to a, a lot of sort of knock-on effects. And what we see is that if people trust technology, they will use it. So we have huge public sectors in Europe. If, if they trust to use technology to provide better public services, well, they will create a market for innovation in, in providing safe public services that are easy to use, that are fast, rather than having to make an appointment or having to come and queue and how things were done in the old days. And, and that market creation is, of course, what enhances uh, innovation. And the second thing is that when you say to the, the very, very big ones, those who literally sometimes keep the gate to the marketplace, you cannot get there if you're a smaller business. Now when we have asked them to open this gate, well then all of a sudden if you invest in a smaller business, well it depends on their idea, their work ethics, the people that they come on board, that they can get to market and make a business out of it. So it's much more obvious to invest in the smaller company than it was before because they were hugely dependent on big tech in order to get to their customer. So I think the point is that not all innovation is equal. You know, some innovation is much better than others. Innovation that is building on, on the respect for privacy and security and, and our ambitions on sustainability is, is a much better piece of innovation than innovation in, in uh, some criminal cluster where they want to scam us again. Of course. Yeah, but still, if you look at um, if you look at <coughs> that, that debate, which obviously is probably triggered also by lobby groups, etc., that um, if we overregulate, innovation will not happen here in Europe. Uh, what's your response to those um, accusations, in a way? But of, of course, one should always uh, listen to criticism that is meant to make things better and not just meant at its defense of anything happening. Because uh, over, over the last years, we have had quite a lot of technologists uh, calling for regulation. We need regulation for this and this and this. And then when we come up with regulation and say, no, not, not quite like that. <laughs> yeah. uh, usually the closer we get to them having to make real choices in their business model, they say, no, no, not, not quite like that. So I, I think sometimes it's, it's more about the business model than it's about the room for innovation. Um, but of course, one should be careful because you can overregulate. You can be too careful and not leave room for all the exciting stuff that, that digitization can bring you. What would you think in that respect? I mean, um, there's a huge market and the consumer, sh of course, should be safe, but still, uh, with like all the new products coming to that market, is it's uh, yeah, it's hard to strike that balance. Yeah, I mean, especially we we the conversations about di digital public infrastructure yeah. are really interesting at the moment because you've got a, a lot of countries thinking about well, how do you how do you put that in place in a, in a constructive way. Um, one of the things that perhaps we haven't touched on is, you know, if you if you get the playing field right and you've got the, you know, how do you create a, a feedback loop? Yeah. One of the things we've seen, for example, in uh, digital payments or digital finance is if you can uh, create, for example, a consumer panel. They've got them in uh, Australia and the UK and Nigeria. You can have a way in which you're starting to see, um, you know, new ideas and build on uh, the, the playing field that's in place because this is moving so fast. You can start to identify the problems and address them. You can start to you know, build uh, as you go. So that's one option. I think the other thing would be looking at standards. You know, if standards are the basis of our technological so society, how much of that system is set up with input from outside, you know, so that we're really building in the way that is in inclusive, yeah. so that it, it works, right? And that, that, I think, then helps innovation emerge and be more robust in the long run. So there's maybe some ad additional points. 
Yeah, but I think with digital infra, public infrastructure, this is a very interesting topic also to look at best practice cases, because especially smaller countries, it reminds me of the Baltics, are very far progressed there. So is that perhaps a way of like also getting that speeded up? Well, I think if we, if we combine sort of uh, technological innovation with how innovation in how we organize things, I think uh, the approval of the vaccines of the COVID times is a very good example <coughs> because in the commission we decided we want to make a full approval. We will not cut any corners. People need to know that this is safe. But instead, as back in the days, you sort of waited for every clinical test to be done and documented, and then moving boxes of documents would enter and someone would have to deal with all of that, and it would take years. We basically just asked to, whenever you have a result, send us the, the, the data, send us the numbers, so that we could follow every step of the way, and when the last clinical trial was done and we were happy with the numbers, we could say go which meant that we could sort of subtract that to an absolute minimum while being as safe as we were before. And, and I think that kind of innovation we need to take on board also if we want to serve uh, consumers well, that we can be faster, not just by technology, but also thinking about how do we actually use technology for, for information to travel faster to those who need uh, to do things. Um, we have a lot of, of, uh, of complaints about uh, businesses that it takes forever to get a permit to build a plant. And part of that is completely justified. But they shouldn't just look at us and say, make us, give us the permit faster. You also need to talk, talk with those who sort of rely on the permit to protect, you know, the, the wildlife or, or the rare species of plants or whatever is there. Because if we want to do things differently, different interests should be taken on board, not just paving the way for one interest. Because that, again, will create trust that this is actually for the greater good and not just to, to privilege one sector who is who's the one everything everybody's talking about right now, instead of forgetting about the other interests that needs to be maintained as well, like enhancing biodiversity. Yeah, talking about, again, um, about the digital infrastructure aspect, um, there are huge efficiency gains, of course, to be able to be unpacked if we went faster here. So what do you think is the trajectory from where we stand now to get Europe into that space? Well, member states are very, very different. Uh, yeah. You just spoke about the Baltic countries. Uh, Estonia, you know, they're just amazing. Uh, they compete a bit, actually, with Ukraine, who has, uh, despite their at war, continued, you know, very, very strong digital uh, uh, development. Uh, they have a wallet, and you can support the military, you can start a business, you can keep your personal paper, and you can vote in the Eurovision. So it's really a place that you want to go. <laughs> Uh, so, very advanced under very difficult circumstances. And, and in other member states, you know, the most treasured machinery in, in the office is still the fax machine. So, you know, maybe some countries could have the benefit of leapfrogging, uh, while others, they are actually already at the front. Where do you see the risks there when it comes to pushing into digital infrastructure? Is it more data? Is it yeah, fraud? Is it scams? What is it? So the, all of this comes back. We look at um, what's the content. There's a, there's a piece which is content. And are we getting the right information through all of this? It obviously, you know, all of the digital world ends up meaning that, you know, Regard, even after you think about the worst safety, thing, am I getting the right financial advice? Mm. You know, is there is there regulation around you know social media? How, how can I even trust? Right, so that's part one. Part two is where does my data go and what's done with it? We've seen examples of you know personalized pricing where for exactly the same thing you're charged five times more because of who you are, and then there's the root of it, which is accountability and responsibility. As civil society, as organizations which are sitting outside trying to you know, um, reflect back and have a sincere, real conversation about where we're going, you can't test, you can't see what the algorithm is. You can't tell what's going on mm. apart from doing really difficult experiments. You know, and we can do those across multiple countries. 
But that accountability, that, that transparency, and being able to reflect back and uncover what is going on is now out there somewhere in the ether. So the more that we can you know, uncover these things, because they are, they are you know, folks may not know it here, but the United Nations agreed that we should have an online marketplace as safe as traditional markets. That's probably not mm. too much to ask for. <laughs> is it truly? as safe, absolutely no, not at all. No. So we have a long way to go. And I think the risk is that we, you know, we, we don't use this moment as, you know, we know how to do this, we don't use it to actually apply it to some of the challenges that we need to solve in a very rapid time frame. That would be a, you know, if one trillion is being spent on scams and we need to, what is it, find three trillion more to, you know, solve our climate crisis, that's a bit, bit of a poor payoff. Yeah. But, but maybe just on, um, on, on that point, that online market should be as safe as offline markets. I think that's also a way of sort of saying, let's have the right expectations. Mm. Because, you know, some of the markets where I go shopping in the summer for, for groceries uh, or, or vegetables, sometimes there is half rotten tomato in, in the bottom of the, of the bag. And say, oh, they could have given me a better one. So sometimes things are not perfect offline either. No. <laughs> and I think that, that should be the right approach, not asking for perfection, but asking for much, much better than what we have right now. And, and the second thing is, if, if things are too good to be true, well, they're probably not true. Uh, if you can get something that seemingly is of great quality and, and it costs nothing, when you get it, it will not be of great quality uh, because, you know, one, one needs to, you know, also hone your critical sense when, when you do your online shopping. Yeah, I think actually you brought up two, um, <laughs> two topics, one the one of content but also of these secret algorithms. Um, I think in one of your recent speeches you've said that um, big tech acts actually privatize their markets because they have secret algorithms we don't know. So it's not about picking like a high-end uh, grocery store where I know it's much more expensive than going to like a retailer, which is very cheap. You just don't know. So how, how difficult is it actually to be able to have a fair pricing here? Well, we are, we are working for algorithm transparency. Yeah. So, you know, people who have the skills to, you know, open the hood and, and look in there that they can do that. But I think more important is to, you know, keep enforcing. We just uh, actually settled with, with Amazon that they stop using the data from all the many, many, many small merchants for their own benefit. Because Amazon would have, you know, fewer product numbers, but they will take the lion's share of the turnover because they would know from all the small merchants what was people looking for, how, what, how long were they looking, what would, w how would they pay, mm. would they ask for the guarantee actually to be triggered. And, and when you have sort of a, a, a pop-up window to response to your search, if that's an Amazon product, there should be a second window with a competing product. So you can, you can change the marketplace if you insist to say, listen, actually, we do have rules because the market should serve the consumer. Yeah. Because then you feel, uh, you know, emboldened and respected. And I think a consumer that is respected is that also rubs off on, on feeling that I'm a citizen that is being respected. It's interesting debate, which is obviously probably um, yeah, initiated, not initiated, but we, we have the same topic all over the world, right? Um, I mean, you, your organization is active all over the world, so how, perhaps to shed some light, how, how different is it in Europe? Is it different in emerging markets? And where do we need to look at? It, it is in a sort of a world that can get very divided and, you know, um, we feel like we're being pulled apart. Talking to consumer organizations, it's remarkable how similar our experiences okay. are. Um, you will, of course, have different um, levels of importance. You will, of course, have incredibly different jurisdictions. You know, consumer policy sits in some places under, under justice, in some under the economy, in some under health. You know, we, we've sort of put it, um, 
perhaps in a corner, it's almost the sort of the inconvenient truth that we need to bring out because there's a lot, there's so much that we can learn from it, especially when it's connected to competition. Um, when you look at the impact of these conversations, those are at the, t they are different in nature. You know, in mm. Korea, you <coughs> will have a different conversation about cryptocurrencies or gaming because they will be far, far ahead of e where you know many advanced countries will be here in Europe. Um, in uh, other places, they will know that that's coming though, and they'll see it. So even yeah. let's take. Um, you know, Brazil, where you'd be talking about digital public infrastructure on a smartphone, um, you will still want to raise some of the issues about how regulation works, how people are involved in the design of this, how the outcomes are measured, same, same approach. Yeah, I mean, time is moving so fast. So before we come to an end of this session, because we have that huge election year this year, and of course the consumer at the end is also the voter, um, is that the first big election where we really need to be careful what we trust when it comes to social media content? Because that debate has moved so, so quickly. Yes, I, I, I think you're right in saying so, in, in particular because it can all be fueled by artificial intelligence. So yeah. where we thought we, we sort of kind of knew because we know the person, we know their voice, we know yeah. how they look, we know how many fingers they have, uh, then all of a sudden, you know, AI has become really, really good. You know, they don't have six fingers anymore or, or strange things. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we have used our legislation when it comes to being able to trust digital services, also to make um, big tech who provides that uh, put on notice that they need to be really careful here, that we can uh, trust the services also taking into consideration how artificial intelligence may fuel that they can be misused to manipulate uh, the elections that we're going to hear in, in the coming uh, weeks. Yeah, and perhaps Helena on that aspect as well, because that AI or the, 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 the advent or the swift advent of AI um, is that coming on top, making things much more difficult? Yeah, I mean, well, elections are happening all around the world this year. It's a big deal. And was it, it was Warren Buffett just the other day was saying, you know, AI scams are going to be the next growth, you know, sector. It, it's, it's going to be quite phenomenal if we don't focus in on not just literacy, but also the fundamentals. And, you know, um, I think the, 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 you know, again, we did this experiment of chatbots around the world, generative AI, uh, generative AI. And the level of sort of hallucination and bias, or it, you, you're starting to see this wherever you are. Um, and people are using it. The rise of use of AI is, of course, you know, something that's been quite remarkable already. So um, but what couldn't agree more with, with Warren. He's clearly reading our stuff. <laughs> Perhaps the last word for you before you're going to talk about AI, right? Yes. and um, And... You know, we have been uh, watching this for a very long time uh, and also working with fact checkers and researchers and NGOs uh, all over Europe because you can have legislation, but you really also need people to push uh, the service providers, big tech, actually to live up to it and do it here and now so that it is, uh, it is as we speak. And, and take down things that are uh, illegal uh, or the absolute minimum to make sure that you can see that this is actually fake. Uh, that you yourself get uh, technology on your, on your smartphone that will recognize things that are really not uh, uh, made by, by the human being that it presents itself <coughs> to be. Because as said initially, we need to be able to trust the integrity of the election because it's the fun foundation of a democratic society. So, uh, so everybody's on their toes uh, right now to make sure that we get it right and that uh, we can trust technology because then we can, you know, get amazing progress through technology. But we need to get in control of that dark side. Uh, otherwise, I think we'll just say, mm, I don't trust you. I don't embrace you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much.